Hey lovelies, Lisa here with today's 78 and ready to dive into the Three of Swords, uh, a card that I think uh, for many of us um, maybe sort of paradigmatically out of all of the minors just shouts out its meaning. Uh, when we look at it in Pixie's imagery, and this the, this card is taken from the, the new Borderless Waitsmith Smith uh, that U.S. Games has put out. But when we look at Pixie's imagery, it's almost impossible to miss the meaning of this card. You know, it's almost impossible not to see within it heartache, sorrow, um, betrayal, pain, suffering. You know, the card seems so obvious in its meaning. Um, so clear in what it's communicating that, um, you know, that when, for instance, a friend of mine who turns to the tarot, particularly when she's um, in moments of confusion or lack of clarity, um, she'll pull cards for herself. When she drew this card a few months ago, um, she texted me immediately because she was so scared at what she thought it must mean. Um, you know, it was hard not to see this as being about betrayal, about heartbreak, right? Almost impossible not to see the threeness of this card as being the, thir the third wheel, right? The, the disruption of a happy relationship of a dyad. So this is one of those cards that just seems to shout its meaning, you know? And, um, you know, here the relationship between the Smith-Waite imagery and its meaning and the Crowley system is there's almost no gap. Crowley's keyword for this card is sorrow. So it's just like, yep, three swords piercing a heart. We know what this is, right? The thing is, when we look a little bit into the history of the imagery of this card, and we realize that Pamela Coleman Smith uh, did research in the British Museum when she was drawing up her cards, and that the British Museum had examples, and then also um, a repainted, reworking, reworking of the Sola Busca Tarot, uh, we realize that you know we may not know what this card means. So the Sola Busca Tarot, 1491, it's the oldest complete tarot deck that exists. And it's the oldest tarot deck that has illustrated scenic pips. And it's a weird deck. Uh, it's also, by the way, the oldest in... Mm, the tarot, the Mantegna tarot is probably, is older and also is engraved, but it's not a, it's not a true 78 card tarot deck. But the, the Sola Busca, 78 cards, you know, five suits, the 22 trumps, the, the 16 of each of the four suits, and the four suits are the suits we know, right? Um, you know, cups, swords, wands, batons, right? And um, coins. I was like, what is that fourth one? Oh, yeah, the, the, the coin thing, yeah. Um, it's, it's, so the Sola Busca is like the oldest real tarot that is also engraved. And I'll put a link below because I just thought it was so cool to um, a video made by uh, a modern printmaker who is a professor at RISD showing the engraving technique that was used for the Sola Busca deck. He doesn't talk about the Sola Busca, but he's demonstrating the kind of um, Burren um, engraving technique. And when you see like how um, arduous the path was to make this deck, it's incredible. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, the deck was, you know, etched in copper, printed, and then painted over with tempera and probably also with gold um, by a later artist. So, you know, this is this is quite quite the product, right? So the Sola Busca, this you know late 15th century deck, the oldest one we have, the oldest engraved true tarot, tarot deck, the oldest deck with illustrated pips. There were copies of some of the cards and a uh, reproduction of the entire deck in the British Museum. Pixie saw that, and her take on some of the minor cards was evidently influenced by the Sola Busca, including her version of the Three of Swords. So what I'm showing today, this is the deck I'm, I'm using, is uh, the out-of-print Los Carabeo version of... Um, the Sola Busca. And this is a redrawn, it's, a, it's not a reproduction, it's not like the current Sola Busca, which I have a, a video on. Um, I think I have a video on it. Maybe I have an unboxing. 
um, from their Antica Anima series, the Solobuska reproduction that they have out now. It is an earlier version of the Solobuska that is based on a redrawing of it. So I have two copies of this deck. This deck is really hard to get for some reason um, and very expensive, so I've been very patient on eBay. I have, um, without a box, a 1995 version. And then I have, and this was called the Illuminated Tarot, Iturochi Illuminati. And then I have a 2000 edition in a kind of beat up box of the Ancient Enlightened Tarot. Now the difference between these two decks, so the uh, Illuminated Tarot, the older one, 1995, is smaller, right? The image is smaller and the overall card is, is both shorter and more narrow. So it's actually, this is kind of, this is like a low scarabeo, normal sized deck, and this feels thinner and smaller in the hand. And it has only the Italian on the top. Um, and I gather that this older one, um, I didn't get a complete version of it, but I gather that this older one did not come with a little white book. It just came with a number of cards, um, as, as sometimes Los Carabao will do, that include the meanings in the different European languages for, like, just keyword meanings for all of the cards. This one, the newer, the 2000 one, has backings that look like this, as opposed to the older backings, which are actually quite beautiful. I think the older ones, I mean, this is, they're similar, but I think these are, are nicer. It has backings that look like this, and it has, you know, it's a keyword-based little white booklet or sort of fold-out, um, but it's pretty good. Finding information on the Solobuska is not easy. There, so there is, for instance, a um, recently released book, and actually nobody here, Annika, has a video on it uh, called The Game of Saturn, um, which... Uh, is a, a book that kind of goes through this very speculative story about secret societies and initiates and mysteries in the uh, 15th and 16th century and tries to make sense of the Solobuska's imagery in light of that kind of speculative history. You know, that's not historical scholarship. That's kind of speculation. So you have something like that. You know, it's, it's learned, but it's, it's way, way, way out there. And then you have, on the other hand, you know, sort of more historical investigations. Um, so, you know, there is a, um, uh, a, an Italian exhibit a few years ago, and I'll put some links to information about this, called um, The Secret of Secrets, which does talk about the alchemical um, symbolism in the Solobusca, particularly in the minors, and talks about the King of Swords, who is... Um, pretty clearly identified as Alexander the Great and talks about this very, very popular medieval manuscript, The, the Secret of Secrets, in which it's, it was thought to be written by Aristotle, although it wasn't. Um, but it purports to be a um, dialogue between Aristotle and his one-time student, Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, and um, in which a Alexander is being taught to be a great king and is learning all about things like alchemy. So that's a very historical um, investigation that this uh, Italian uh, museum did into the imagery that says, look, there is, you know, Renaissance alchemy was real and there are alchemical images in this deck. But nobody knows what these images really mean. And yet, you know, it's really clear when you look at the Three of Swords that this is imagery that Pixie was influenced by and which has produced a very easily understood um, modern graphic. We know what this means. But do we know what this means? Sofia de Vicenzo, um, who wrote a booklet, um, I, I th she's also a scholar, um, I think maybe even an art historian. She wrote a booklet about the, the Solobusca deck that was produced um, in, in Italy and then uh, translated and reproduced for US games. It's also hard to get. I had to order it through interlibrary loan at my university. Um, but I'll put information about that below as well. Anyway, she says, look, you know, the heart image in Christian culture being pierced by, you know, 
a weapon like this. This is the Sacred Heart, and this is clearly, we see all of the garlands here. This is victorious image. This is an image of a kind of suffering, perhaps, like the suffering of the Sacred Heart of Christ, right? The kind of suffering that um, nonetheless is about victory. So this is a positive card for Sofia de Vicenzo. Um, I like that reading. Um, and in, in essence, I mean, to me, the fact, again, I mean, we talked a little bit about this with the Two of Swords yesterday, you know, the fact that there could be such competing connotations for this card, like this is heartbreak, this is, you know, a kind of triumph, that's what the swords are all about, that double-edged nature right? That the things that cut our world, that cut our world into meaning one way or t'other, um, the things that cut our world can also always cut the other way. Even if it's only because our minds are so big that if I say, hey, this is about heartache, I'm also able to recognize the ways in which that judgment itself invokes the opposite of heartache, invokes joy or triumph. Like, we define things and in defining things, we create a light side and a dark side, right? A front and a back. That double-sided nature of our own minds is what the swords are in the first place about. And I want to add to that double-sidedness something that I've noticed in the Sola Busca um, at, just a couple weeks ago as I've been working with, um, working with this deck. And that is, you know, we go through the swords, we go through the swords, we go through the swords. And I just was always kind of thinking, yeah, it's funny that the swords are red. And then you get to the knight. And I realized, oh, the swords aren't red. The sheaths of the swords are red. This is a suit in which all of the figures are carrying swords that are still in a sheath, still protected except for the knight. So that now leads us to a very different reading as well. These are not swords in their cutting, in their most sharp cutting blade that are driving through this heart. These are all swords that are still shielded, still sheathed. And so if we think about swords as having two sides, having two edges, we also have to remember that swords have sheaths, that sometimes they cut and sometimes they're tucked away. So what does it mean to pull the sword out of the sheath? What does it mean to protect the cutting blade? What does it mean to protect ourselves? To what extent is the heart itself a sheath for the sword? To what extent is this an image of us not being cut up by the sharp edge of life? but instead an image of us putting our weapons away. The heart as a sheath. You know, I, Shakespearean that I am, I can't, I can't help but think about um, Juliet here, you know, who turns her heart into a sheath in suicide. Uh, you know, it's interesting to think about the ways in which the sacrifice, maybe even a Christian sacrifice, that takes on the pain of others is actually sheathing the sword of suffering. I take this on so you're released. So that's a really different understanding than this. Okay, sheaths, hearts, swords, all that stuff, yeah. Okay, I think that's all I got for today, <laughs> except for the other video that I still probably need to film because I'm one day behind. Oh. Four of Swords, coming right up, folks. All right. As always, thank you so much for watching. And, um, yeah, take good care.